speaker talk about the independent living fund apart from in the sort of general terms like you say your you know, it's all been attacked blah, blah, blah. What, what's the link up even even within the logic of the people who are doing this in the city how is all these zillions of um, you know derivatives and all that going to be sorted out by taking away 350 million or just a few pennies I don't understand how that's helping them can you explain the link I think targets can be useful, but they're a very blunt tool, and it depends who you're putting in charge to monitor the targets. But tar targets were fundamentally um, what led to Mr. Thatcher. They were going for financial targets to reach a balance, so they would go get foundation trust status. So the managers decided to the best way to cut spending is to cut staff. So instead of having nurses try our patients, they had receptionists doing it. But the um, Francis inquiry failed to link government policy with the deaths that occurred. Far easier to blame the staff, which is what happened. And this is what's happening with your point. So Jeremy Hunt doesn't think up any of this stuff. You know, somebody more, far more intelligent is thinking up his messaging. And it achieves many things. So it beats the profession down, so you demoralize further. Destroys the trust with the patient and the profession. So the, the deserved respect that the public have for the NHS, because you know, even independently it's proven to be the best system, if you can break that trust, so you, get, you increase demand from the patient, so you, the, the doctors get fed up with unnecessary demand from the patient, and you destroy the reputation so the patients say, well, this isn't very good. We're being softened up for the end state, and the end state is a HMO model which does not need doctors. Yeah. So you, where you had 10 doctors looking after a population of 20,000, you'll have three who will look after unqualified staff, HCAs and lowly trained nurses. Far more profitable for people like United Health and Kaiser to run that model, which they have in the US. I'm sure Stacey will back me up. So if you break the necessity that the patients have in their mind, I need to see my doctor. And in, in place of that, you've got, well, doctors are no good, they're missing cancer, I can just see anybody. We're being softened up for the end game. Yeah? And that's what we all need to be mindful of. So his message, don't look at it superficially, is, is what, what, is it, what else is behind that message? And the message is you don't need GPs. Thanks. Do you want to put on that point yeah, well, that's part of the financial war. It's the same as what he's talking about, about demoralization and intimidation. Um, you know, Piketty, Thomas Piketty wrote this book that everybody's talking about, and he says, looking at hundreds of years of history, in fact, the post-World War II era is the anomaly. That's the outlier. This uh, so-called, you know, is less of a wealth and income gap. We might just be going back to the norm, and I think that's what they prefer, is more of a feudal sort of system. And as long as you're beaten down and you owe them debt always, like you, you're never free. They don't want independent living funds. They don't want a national health service. They don't want a community. They don't want you to have anything for free. You always have to pay them their toll at a toll booth that they erect everywhere, all around you. There's nothing that is communal. It's all like private. Um, in terms of the NHS, now I come up in America, obviously, and. Um, that's another, that's like a Guernica. I mean, that, that it's like a, another system that I don't think you want. I'll just show you a, a one story I have, is my mother was a state legislator for Connecticut. So that those are the golden insurance policies you always hear about when they're tearing apart the health insurance in America. They're saying like, oh, these uh, you know state officials and you know, politicians, they get all sorts of free stuff and they get, you know, we, that's why we should take it away from everybody. 
Well, here she is. She gets lung cancer and that spreads her brain. So she, uh, uh, the, the basically, I had a friend, a good friend, who suggested we contact Yale because her hospital wouldn't cover any of the costs. And they said, go to Yale because they're the best at dealing with brain cancer. The head of Yale Medical School, one of the best medical schools in the world, is also the editor of a journal on gamma knife technology. He said, you know, um, I can extend your life by at least a year. At least, I guarantee you. Her insurance company, not doctors, they're just some, you know, bankers. They said, no, sorry, it's just palliative. She won't, we're not gonna treat her. So anyway, she had to go and do it herself, pay for it, and uh, four years later, she's still here. That doctor fought so hard, he had to, he was like in shouting matches with him, saying, I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> like, I can tell you, I guarantee you, she will be alive in a year. And they said, no, she has three months at most. So, you know, this is the sort of thing that you're constantly having to deal with somebody who's a third person outside of your intimate relationship, you know, your private relationship with the doctor telling you how to treat yourself. And it's some, essentially a financial services guy telling you whether or not they're, they're willing to pay for it. And financial implications do come even with the National Health Service, yeah. as we are well aware. We've even mentioned, I think it's coming on, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. I mean, I have a constituent who uh, is being denied that treatment because they're saying it's too expensive. Yeah. I mean, and in other parts of the country, he might very well uh, be able to obtain that. So, obviously, you know, we're making representations to uh, to uh, try and uh, you know, get that get that funding uh, for him. I just wonder, though, I mean, because obviously there's a lot of doom and gloom and things aren't right, we know that. Austerity and so on. And you know, I think it's really important that we need to be kind of optimistic and give an alternative. Yeah, there is an alternative, isn't there? Uh, available. We just need to, to seize it. And I don't know if one of the speakers maybe might want to contribute uh, on this point. And, and that is that um, you know, I look to Latin America and see how they turn their back on neoliberalism and look at what's happening in, in Ecuador and in Venezuela and, and, and in and other South America. Countries and uh, you know, whilst things aren't perfect, from the very kind of low base, the neoliberalism basically thrust, uh, I think, 40% of the South American population into poverty. There has been a, a real significant reversal of that, and uh, things seem, from what I can see anyway, uh, to have improved uh, considerably. It's still a long way to go, but certainly looking at an alternative uh, uh, model to the kind of neoliberal model that, that, that wrecked that continent and is. You know, has wrecked and is in the process of continuing to wreck kind of Western European economies, it seems to me, as well. I'm just interested in, in your point as well, and indeed you, uh, Stacey, whether or not you, whether you feel that kind of Latin American model might be uh, something that we could maybe learn some lessons from going forward. Uh, the you can tell your experience in the Well, um, Colombia is a very neoliberal country that hasn't followed the the path that other Latin American countries have, have gone down. But even those countries like Ecuador and Venezuela that have opted for a different model, unfortunately still base it on extractive industries. And I don't know what else they're basing on, but it's a shame they base it on extractive industries because it means communities are still suffering in both Ecuador and Venezuela from the kind of projects that I've seen wrecking people's livelihoods in Colombia. But I want to speak about hope even in a, a neoliberal country like Colombia, because one of the, the really inspiring things that uh, I came across on my visit a couple of weeks ago were these, that here are people who have been continuously deceived, threatened, livelihoods wrecked by this horrible mining company with its three London listed multinational owners, and they're still there, they're still struggling, and despite the appalling deal that they get, it's a better deal than they were getting 14 years ago, and it's a better deal than people have got at other mine sites in Colombia where the struggle has been perhaps less well organized. Also, there's three kinds of communities there. There's indigenous communities, why you indigenous people. There's people of African descent, and there's the ordinary Colombian peasantry, or a mixture of, of various ethnicities. And they're all working together. No, not in the communities being of the community. No, absolutely not the white elite. It's the white elite who's no. oppressing them. It, it is not white elite in the agricultural community. So those three kinds of communities are deliberately working together in alliance with one another, and they're getting more 
because they're working in unity. One of the indigenous communities has got a relatively decent relocation agreement because at every stage of their interaction with the company, they absolutely insisted that everybody in that community had to discuss every proposal that was made, whether by the community or by the company, and they insisted they were not budging until they got what they wanted, which was brilliant. And finally, they said to us, which was really, really moving and helpful for those of us visiting from outside Colombia, that international solidarity really helps them, because at least it gives them courage to keep going in the face of threats and grief, even if they don't seem to be achieving anything. So those, those two lessons that I took, the importance of unity and the importance of solidarity, were three, and the importance of carrying on struggling. So we need to do that here too. I, I think on a national level, I think any Empires like to control everything. America's an empire now, and they'll destroy any nation that stands up to them. Look at Cuba, 60 years later, they're still sanctioned for them. However, on a smaller scale, on these communities, and uh, things like crowdfunding, peer-to-peer, -peer, cryptocurrencies, all these sort of things. Uh, in, in Kenya, you have this M-Pesa, uh, you know, outside of the, you know, and, and, they, and, and in Kenya, they came up with M-Pesa because they're not, they're excluded from the, the U.S. dominated banking system, so they came up with their own. If, as long as the, the emperor doesn't notice them and get angry with them, they're fine. But I think it's also. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say about Ecuador, environmental sustainability is, is enshrined in the constitution, mm -hmm. and they are looking to move away from mm -hmm. the attractive uh, industries. And uh, well, they are where they are, and uh, you know, uh, obviously they want to make sure that uh, you know, well, it's distributed more evenly. Yeah? The, the population, I think we should applaud them for that, while acknowledging obviously there is still something to go about, they, they will acknowledge that too. Actually. There's a woman there, and uh, a gentleman there, and uh, a gentleman there, and then we'll, and, um, well, we'll take those three, shall we, and then we'll uh, come back and see if the panel's got a comment, and then we'll come back. So, yes, sir. to me 
with that, but I've spent 18, 20 years protesting outside there, shouting at you lot in here, being ignored, which I must admit, it's nice to be ignored in here, but it's kind of the illusion of democracy is doing the same thing. It kind of feels to me the only way you're going to take down what is essentially the status quo is by admitting capitalism and its own game and creating true capitalism. Not the crony capitalism where people get to print up the money they want to buy the assets they want. The way I see it, the more people start switching to using cryptocurrencies in, in whatever form, I mean, Bitcoin or whatever it turns out to be that's the winner, that's the way we're going to force change. Because that's the way we suddenly have a situation. It's not just a currency, it's just a blockchain, it's a public ledger. So it's, it's hard to uh, like create a quadrillion of fake derivatives for everybody by nothing. So they not be, everybody, everybody has people asking. Uh, yeah. yeah. As soon as that money is made redundant, yeah. as soon as they're holding all the dollars and we say, well, good luck with those dollars, we stop using those. That's a bit embarrassing for you, but you know, we're not using those anymore. So pile them higher, so wherever, you know, whatever you want to do with them, we're using this now. Yeah. Well, I don't think there is a real movement. Uh, well, there is, I've, I've started a promise that does exactly that, that all my suppliers are paid in Bitcoin. Everyone all through the supply chain, and only the customers can pay Bitcoin. Well, I mean, that's one part. Okay, but, but the point I was going to make is that, uh, you know, we see Thomas Piketty's uh, capital in the 21st century, and, and, and uh, you know, the maxim that he's referred to in there, that, uh, that markets and capitalism should be the slave of democracy, not the other way around. And we are the other way around at the moment. Well, that's the best seller even in America, incredibly, uh, you know. And, uh, he came and spoke here, there was a really fantastic uh, uh, attendance, bigger than, than we have to in Committee Room 14, and it was packed, that's a huge, huge room. So I think there is a movement now uh, uh, abroad in, in this country and, uh, and across the, the globe, and it's about how we can kind of, I think, pull all those uh, you know, progressive forces together, and uh, hopefully this is, this is part of that. Look, there's a few points there, and there's lots of people wanting to contribute now, so can I just ask the speakers, whoever wants to kind of respond to uh, the points that we just had to be as brief as, as possible. We've only got nine minutes left. Brendan, do you think you wanted to come in on? Yeah, I mean, I think that point about race is interesting. Um, but unfortunately, we are born into the language of race. Like, it's, it's very difficult to uh, overcome it. We have to recognize, recognize that um, that we are born into um, divisions. And we have to be aware of it in order to deconstruct it. But we can't skip that step. Like, the, f the first way to sort of deconstruct it is to be like actually painfully aware of it because it's actually ignoring race that makes racism work. Um, just on the kind of currencies and all that kind of stuff and globalization, I, 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 it worries me a lot. I think um, globalization is a disaster. It's, I mean, it's murder. This is the, you know, the second wave of globalization after years ago, and, you know, particularly 150 years ago. So it, to me, it's... How do we do... What, so it's, it's bad. What do we do? Well, I think people should be able to live... I mean, I don't try and... I, I think a lot of what the white left wants to do is have a bit more of the colonial pie. And I think what I am interested in is, pe is people having the right to live how they want, where they are, and not having to participate in a globalization that is completely detrimental to their lives. Yeah, I have a point about the judiciary. Um, I'm actually a practicing solicitor, so um, I've got some views about this. Um, I mean, the, the legal system is not, is not neutral. It is, has been created by um, those in power and or organized in power. You know, it's, it's for their purposes. So um, I don't think we can get justice from the legal system. Um, but the reason why we took the case, we, took the, we decided to take the private prosecution because it, it, it seemed to be a brilliant campaigning opportunity. It was, it was a, an opportunity to further extend this campaign, to popularise it, to get our messages out there even more. Um, we don't expect to get favourable outcomes, despite the fact that everyone you know, that knows about the answer knows that the crimes took place there. Um, in my view, you know, we need to get we need to get organised. We need those strong social movements that led to like popular leaders in, in, in South America and, and some other countries. Um, we need lots of serious, organised, and effective direct action. And 
I think this is the lesson of the other social movements that have been successful, and I can name, I can name a lot of them. So in terms of like long-term changes to the legal system, I think I think that we can that we can do this by starting at the bottom with strong social movements, and suffragette civil rights movements, and then and then drive the constitutional change from, from the bottom up. But it's definitely not going to come from the judiciary. It's going to come from us. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Was all there right to the Um Yeah, I was about race getting worse. I mean, I work in a primary school and I actually think things have got a lot better. Um, I mean, when I was at school, I'm a primary school teacher, when I was at school, all my, all my teachers were white, middle-class women. I work in a primary school in East London and all our teachers are East London. We all went to school in East London. Some are white, some are black, some are mixed race. You know, so we're all working class East Londoners who have graduated from well. Mm -hmm. Also, when I was at school, the failing group where it was always black, black Caribbean boys, and now it's actually white rich boys that, that do the worst, uh, perform the worst in schools, followed by rich born boys of, of any race, um, colour, whatever. But, um, and I, I think that's because a lot of things have been put in place. For example, I never learned Islam at school, we, 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 we teach Islam um, in our school, in, in all schools now. Also, we have um, groups specifically targeting children who don't speak English as the first language, so those children, they're not the underperforming groups anymore. So I, just, I, I disagree that those things have got worse, not in, not in all areas, and it's definitely not perfect, but um, I think a lot of change has been made, and it's definitely a lot, better, um, a lot better from my perspective anyway. No, I do. No, thanks for that point. Uh, yes. So we hear all about debt, and we hear all about money that we owe. Um, and we see uh, successive governments that really just seem to be uh, administrating neoliberalist capitalism. And we see parliaments that act quite clearly against the interests of the people. How then do we, the people, change our parliaments and change our governments when, when people are being engaged, the system just comes so strongly uh, <coughs> down against them? Uh, what act will it take um, past the pushing point that we, the people, will eventually rise up and do something about it? I mean, Money is only belief, and the belief that we give it is the power it has over us. But is there a point where Parliament is no longer part of the solution, but actually part of the problem? Yeah. Mm. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. <coughs> the issues that we've caught, caught tonight, I haven't got a comprehensive list here, but national health, unemployment, chronic capitalism, problems in, in the mining game. Will the signing of TTIP help us? No. no. Oh, sorry. And can I just follow that on with another point? What percentage of the population are aware of TTIP? If we live in a democracy, should we not know more about it? None of the major parties, including the Labour Party, mentioned it in their, in their uh, debate in the European elections, where it just four weeks ago, there was one party that did, Caroline Lucas is a morning representative in this house, it is, it is going to be an extremely influential tr trade agreement which will increase the dominance of the United States even more than we are dominated now. Would you agree? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, just a few things. I found it very intriguing, like, uh, I really like the artist taxi driver, but no swearing when they're in Parliament, it all seems <laughs> whatever. Um, yes. I've had, yeah, yeah, well, let's get some fucking swearing in. Everyone <laughs> sat in the back, back seats because they're not, you know, brave enough. I don't, not all polite, or we're just polite and nice people, we don't want to sit in the MPs chairs. Um, if if uh, these quadrillion currencies being dealt with and whatever is actual real money, and we don't have a Tobin tax, and we really are run by psychopathic fucking nutters, right? But it's made up figures. Whether trillions of is, is working out, being traded across floors between computers, between whatever, that a very, very small elite are creaming off some money. I mean, it's just made up. It, I personally think it's made up money. So whether it's whether it's one billion that lasts 31 years, or, or a quadrillion that would be you know, 230,000 years of worth of money or whatever. It's all just, for me, it's just made up figures on, on, on that type of thing. 
I think people should start just doing, you know, minor things of civil disobedience all the fucking time. Start spray painting boots with Zug. You know, that's where all their money goes to. It sounds like a good tag name. Drop some, uh, go to your, go to your joke shop and buy some uh, stink bombs and drop them in Cafe Nero. You know what I mean? If they're not going to pay taxes, just do little things. Start thinking. Tell your mates. All of you who are on Facebook, do Twitter, whatever. Let's start, you know, breaking fucking windows. You know what I mean? Okay, uh, not sure. Um, that's probably anecdotal. But uh, Brian Ho was saying when um, two million, one million, two million people actually marched uh, back in 2003, and he did point out if 10,000 people actually stayed in Parliament Square, there wouldn't have been a war in Iraq. Uh, the same way that a few weeks ago, 50,000 people, I think it's more like 40, 45,000, I tried to count it, uh, March during no more austerity. If only 5,000 of them actually stayed in Parliament Square, we wouldn't, we, uh, the conversation would be different. Instead, it was more like, how come the BBC didn't actually report on it? And we had to actually um, do a Twitter storm um, and all these things. Yeah, the civil dis disobedience does actually work. We do have the solutions. Um, Getting, making sure that the banks can't create money. It should be, I'm not even sure if the, if the government should be able to create money, but there should be a way of actually the people being able to create money without actually having to go to a bank or even to um, a central bank uh, that's actually um, controlled by the government. Uh, it should be only controlled by the people. Uh, there must be a way of doing that. Um, the Chartists wanted to have a yearly parliaments. I would vote for that. And October 17th, we're going to be here uh, outside. Well, we're going to be in Parliament Square, and we're going to be doing some uh, civil disobedience. You're all welcome. So please, <laughs> come with us. Thank you. We'll have some a few of them, so you can find them in Occupy London.
the comments which have been raised in that last round of, uh, of speakers. So, I'll try you uh, at the end of a few or two is to the biggest hope is to expose the lies as often as you can. Um, the government are trying very hard through the BBC to keep everything quiet. So they must be quite worried about the general public waking up and finding out what they're up to. So that's what I've been trying to do uh, locally, holding public meetings and uh, various bits and pieces. So if, all is, if we can all as individuals try and wake up our work colleagues, our family, our friends to what's going on, that, that will all help. I think uh, to to sort of inform people. Um, I'd like to operate on the slogan kind of um, think global at local. So I think this is really important for us to be in tune with what's going on around the world and using examples from it, but practice it in our day-to-day -day lives. And some of the examples that I like to use is um, I think everyone should learn how to grow their own foods. I think that's really important. Um, in, in the sense where it kind of refrains you from having to support these supermarkets and global corporations that provide you with something that isn't necessarily of substance that you can actually do yourself. And also collect money, um, form corporations, but mini corporations within your communities to support each other so you don't have to go directly to the banks. I think enough people did that, they would, they would eventually become obsolete. So that's kind of like the small things that we can practice. Thank you. I'd like to tie the financial work to the resource boards and to all the race that everybody's been talking about. Is right now what I think we see in Europe and the UK and America, you see the citizens there receiving what treatment has been bestowed upon the peoples of Asia, Indonesia, for example, uh, Africa, uh, uh, the Latin America. Those nations are some basket cases because Western banks impose debt upon them to perhaps dictators that they install. And then we're able to take all the resources and then sell it all, the debt to the IMF, i.e. the global community, and then impose austerity upon them. That's been happening to them for decades. Now it's coming here because they, the machine, the debt machine needs to be fed. So I think it's, uh, there, it's part of the divide and conquer. We should just, we're basically all humans being where the cannon fodder to this financial war. The um, Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership was mentioned, TTIP. I think it would be a complete disaster, partly on the basis of the free trade agreement that the European Union has recently signed with Colombia, which uh, provoked massive resistance in Colombia and a national agrarian strike because of it undermining people's food security and food sovereignty with cheap imports from the United States, from Europe in the EU case and a previous agreement with the United States. So that's undermining people's ability to make a livelihood out of agriculture there and grow their own food. And what TTIP will bring us is the right of huge companies to sue national governments for bringing in environmental or human rights or worker rights legislation if it's going to affect their profits. So it's a way of giving big corporations like these horrible mining companies that operate in Colombia even more power over the rest of us. So I think that's a disaster. Yeah, um, it's disastrous, not, not just because of, there's about me and the Richard just gave, um, but in a whole range of ways that would really reduce the standards, uh, make it much more difficult to tackle climate change and, and a range of other things. There's a big mobilisation on the 12th of July national mobilisation which is being coordinated by a uh, world development movement and other groups so I'd encourage people to get involved in that. And, and just to say um, it's great for disseminating information that's, that's important and valuable but, but really we need to get a lot more organised so I'd encourage people to, to join groups and um, well in time when people are ready to think about sort of like targeted and effective direct actions and what we really need to do to be effective as a movement in the long term is to disrupt the status quo to actually uh, stop it from happening because you know <laughs> they know that we're pissed off but if we're not going to actually do anything to actually physically stop this system from destroying everything then it will continue. Yes, I would support that. Um, <laughs> I think that just on food, if I could just make 99% of our food is from the Americas. So bananas, everything. 99%, so just to keep that in mind when we think of colonialism a bit. But what, what I would um, encourage
encourage people to do that comes from that point, and, and particularly white people to use their privilege to realize that I went to prison, but I, my life has more or less bounced back because I'm a white middle class man. I have an enormous amount of privilege, and most white people do, regardless of your working class or upper class. And to use that in, in solidarity, not with your own interests, but with the interests of the most marginalized and the most vulnerable and the most attacked, and to use that privilege for them, and then that will work probably for you in the end as well. Yeah, and I think I'm just sort of which whenever I come to these meetings always seems to be the one with the most disagreement. I mean, you know, I can tell you about how bad things were for me as a black graduate, um, and that's my opinion, but, you know, the stats that I quote from the Department of Work, of, of work and Pensions, that's not my opinion. That is some hard evidence of the fact that young black and brown people are being hit hardest by youth unemployment. Um, you know, it's nice that the measures being put in place now in schools, and it's nice that the state is starting to recognize that um, black and brown people exist and that we have different needs. But the reality of the matter is, um, when we talk about poverty and when we talk about class, we have to apply, to apply a race lens to it. And like, that's not to discount that there are, there's poverty and there's inequality amongst people who are also white, but what it doesn't do, it doesn't discount that, but it says that it hits people harder. And without recognizing the fact that it hits some, some harder than others, you will solve the problem for some, but not for others. Okay, thanks so much, Shanine. Just a, a few concluding uh, remarks from me, in part, I use my uh, place in the, uh, in the chair. And really picking up on the comment that was made about what do we do to, uh, you know, reverse neoliberal capitalism. Well, you know, I'm a fairly simple bloke. I'm, you know, less than 15. I'm a working class lad. I was a bricklayer. That's my background. I have to be in Parliament now. But uh, my view is that we, we obviously need a mass movement. We've got to build this movement. It, we've got to reach out and engage with, you know, working class, middle class communities right across the right across the uh, the country. Uh, and I think that means uh, supporting uh, uh, trade unions. Uh, we're seeing globalisation. Globalisation is one-way street at the moment. In my view, the way you kind of uh, respond to globalisation is kind of have a globalised movement. I mean, a globalised trade union movement, it seems to me. But I think, you know, simple uh, goals from, from my perspective, and I think back to kind of 1945 and my dad, my mum and dad's generation, and, uh, you know, they said, we're not going to go back to what we experienced in the 1930s after all that we have suffered then and going through the Second World War. And, uh, you know, they got involved and they looked at a Labour government, a radical Labour government that, that introduced the welfare state, that built houses, that created the National Health Service. Uh, and, and my plea to people is get involved in, in groups and organisations, yes, but get involved in the political process. I'd like you, obviously, to join the Labour Party. If you're in the Labour Party, make it easier for people like me and John McDonnell to actually, you know, effect the policy changes that are needed. Because we need political power, in my view, in this place, to actually make the changes that we all want to see. And I agree with the woman there who said, you know, things have improved. We, you know, we can, I think, sometimes be a bit too depressed and, and think we haven't made progress. We have made progress. Uh, we've certainly made progress. You, you articulated that, I think, very effectively in, in your contribution. And I have to say, you know, when I joined the Labour Party all those years ago, I mean, before me ever becoming an MP, was just, you know, I couldn't do that. Impossible. I Happen. So, in my plea is to get involved and get elected, get here, help us to make a difference. And I just want to finish off by giving John McDonnell an opportunity, if he doesn't want to say anything, but nevertheless invite him to, to comment because uh, this whole People's Parliament initiative is John's uh, idea uh, and uh, we've had you know, mm. a lot of meetings already. I think they've been, been really successful, brought people uh, together, as I've already said, we've tried to pull together the uh, you know, the, the ideas and thoughts which have been uh, articulated each of, at each of those uh, meetings and so on. And John, perhaps just, just say a few words uh, with your comments. Well, just to give my apologies, I was at another meeting, and that meeting was a discussion about um, where we go with regards to the Scottish referendum. Not, because, not whether you're in favour or against the Scottish referendum. As a group of people come together, so we'll, 
why don't we use the result of the Scottish Scottish referendum, whichever way it goes, to say actually in this country we need a constitutional convention in which we talk about democracy, and that's what you've come to here. Really. And interesting that TTIP came up there because that will remove whole tiers of democracy from us. And it, it, what's, what came out of that was all different groups saying, actually, why don't we catch the wind around the Scottish referendum and say we need a constitutional convention here, not to talk about regional government or proportional representation or anything like that, but to talk about the real world, about why, why, don't, why can't we control our economy? Why have we had a finance bill debate today it's been, where our taxation legislation has been written by the City of London Corporation, that sort of thing? Why is it that Indian and Westminster can get 200 police on Saturday to surround people in wheelchairs to prevent them just having a demonstration? Mm -hmm. So the idea behind the discussions in the other room was, was to complement this, basically, is to say we've got to move this debate on from a debate into action. And one of the things that we want to do in the autumn is launch a statement around bringing people together again to say how do we change the whole constitution of this country? Not a dry, Arab legalistic <coughs> debate, but actually a practical debate about how we take control of our lives back again, both on the shop floor, within our communities, and yes, internationally and globally as well. So what I, th what I found interesting, I don't know what you think about it, the reason we opened up these debates in, in this building was as a statement of principle that we own, you know, it's to take the building back from the bastards, really. We own the building, you know. This is our, this is our we're trying to create a new form of democracy within the belly of the beast, if you like. So I, I think I'm just glad that all the meetings have been packed out. Joe and, and Seb, between them, have organised it all, done a tremendous piece of work. It's been really stimulating. But there's no, I'm an old-fashioned old Marxist. There's no point in talking about theory if you don't think it's a practice. You know that concept of praxis? So just as in the other room, every debate we've had has always been about, this is, these are the issues we want to confront, but what are we going to do about it? Here's the theory. Here's the praxis, and here's the practice, and you link that together. So in the other room, it's just saying, right, what we'll do is make a statement on the Scottish referendum, saying we need a constitutional debate here, but if we're not going to be able to narrow confines of constitutional debate about structures, etc., it's about how we take back control of our lives. And part of that was, will be exactly as, as Chris has said, is how do you re-engage in the political process and have some influence? Now, that might range from stringing up the occasional MP or whatever, but at least it's ensuring that we get engaged again, and get having some form of influence of power. And what Mark has been doing as the uh, artist taxi drive, repping and blinding um, on, on the films and all the rest of it, has demonstrated there's so many mechanisms that you can now use to highlight an issue and get people together to take back the power again. And I think all of us now, we need to think about it really seriously. I don't know if put this on you, but I think we all have an individual responsibility in our shoulders now to do something, to do something, and just to say, I'm not taking it anymore, but I'm going to react, and I'm going to react by contributing to the debate or towards action or whatever, but I'm just not going to sit back and take it anymore. Now, Chris is trying to recruit me to the Labour Party, I think it's a really pious hope, <laughs> and that's only because we're huddling together for warmth at the moment. <laughs> But every, I just say to you, every form of action now is legitimate. Every form of action. So on July the 10th, we'll be having, trade, we'll be having trade unions coming out in mass industrial action. Others will be taking forms of direct action as they attempted on Saturday. Others will be engaged in an intellectual debate in which they, they're best with the production of ideas, intellectual work. I think, I think that's all valid. It's all valid. Because at the moment, what they're trying to do is say basically people aren't political or they're not interested. Yes, they are. Know. People are really interested because they're angry. They're looking for alternatives. The alternatives aren't being presented by them. So the part of this process is to create our own alternatives. I just hope, I hope you've found this useful just coming here and having those sorts of debates. Before we go, I'd just like to thank Seth and Joe for what they've done. It's very nice of uh, John to put on the People's Parliament and I've come to another uh, couple of uh, things. And it's really nice, it's fantastic to listen to everybody tonight and um, I got uh, very emotional when JJ was doing the phone, but also when everyone else was, was talking. But to me, the Labour Party is the war machine. 
That is the fucking war machine. I'm telling you right now. They are in, in, in the world. I don't mean to talk about neoliberalism. Jesus fucking Christ, mate. <laughs> I would never, I would never, I swear to God, I would never, ever vote for the Labour Party. Ever. Not even. Why, why would you do that? That man over there, Bob Gill, did you actually listen to what he said? Did everyone listen to what Bob said? He told you what the Labour Party done to the NHS. And all this, all this politics, like John aside, but John, I, He's a good guy, John, and he's out. Uh, he's, uh, he's, he's telling people to wreck the place, you know what I mean? I, 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 I'm exempting John. Listen, these people, these people, they, they, they play good cop, bad cop. One's in power, the other's in power. They went to a war in Iraq. There's people now talking about things like David Lammy. Do you know what I mean? All these other people that, that, that talk about, like, they, they, they wanted to burn Iraq. Do you know what I mean? That lady on the, on the news the other day, bomb them, bomb them, bomb them. That was the Labour Party. That was who was calling, let's go out there. Didn't call for the, as soon as Tottenham was on fire, he was like, oh my fucking God, don't, don't put Tottenham on fire. Now these people have no conscience. They have nothing. They care about themselves. They care about their own property and their own business portfolios. That's the Labour Party. That's Ed Miliband holding up the sun. They do not give a fuck about anybody. Mm -hmm. They yeah. don't. <laughs> If you talk about this guy here, Richard, he, he talked about one place, Colombia. If you look at BHP Billiton and, and Glencore and, and, and all these Rio Tinos, they're everywhere signing deals. We, we, we interviewed a guy from, from the Kalimantan in bloody Indonesia. He's in Borneo. It, it's the rainforest. It's an island. And then and, and, and Barclay Bank and his government signing up deals for railways to go and mine coal in the middle of a fucking Borneo. What? Do you know what I mean? They are they are on a death wish for the planet. The tar sands in Canada. You're talking about talk about like financial wars and about debt. You know, you look at places like we were talking about Haiti. They still own debt to France. They're not going to pay it back. You know, anything. The war machine is everything. It's about debt. Do you know what I mean? You're easier to control when you are enslaved in debt. So with the first thing they want, sign up. You've got a choice. Youth unemployment. You've got two choices. Go on a slave labour death camp work fair with Ian Duncan Smith working at Tesco with a paper hat on. Are you sign up to fifty thousand pound worth of debt? You go in, you go to university, fifty thousand pounds worth of debt. That's you done. That's your life. Forget about it. Because that debt will never end. Once you do it once, it's never ever gonna end. That's the war machine. Well, we're gonna have to uh, okay. call, call it to an end there. Thank you guys, thanks for uh, joining us and um, yeah, well, I'll post it up on YouTube as well, but, so it should be fun. Thank you, Carl, Carl uh, thank you, Carol, and, um, and see you guys later on. Peace out.